Good evening. Good evening. It's good to see everyone here this evening. It's good to be here. It's good to sing praises to our God. I don't know about uh, the other speakers, but as for me, this is the first time that I'll be speaking in front of a video camera. <laughs> and uh, now I'm not sure how well I feel about that. Uh, now keep on rolling, I guess. But but um, my brothers always told me that I have a. Vo a face for radio really, so I'm not sure how well it's going to work out for you guys. <laughs> but we'll push on and we will take a look and I hope that this study is beneficial to you as we take a look at the spoils of victory. Let's turn over to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you'd like to put your marker there, that's where we'll be turning back to quite frequently. 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be looking at a few verses from this passage. 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. Paul's come to the end of his life in this passage. He realizes that the end is near. And he looks back over his time spent on earth, and he thinks in his mind, I've done what I think I ought to have done. I live my life in a way that I think is pleasing to God. I've done what He has commanded me, and I have confidence that he, I have been a good soldier of the cross. And as he says that, he remembers, I'm sure, everything that he had given up for the cause of Christ. And yet he was willing to give up his own life for that cause. And he was willing to give it up because he knew that there was a prize at the end. He knew that all of this was not just so that uh, he could boost himself up, but he knew that God would glorify him. That God would exalt him in the end because of how he had lived his life here on earth. That he would gain everything because he had lost everything. In Philippians chapter 1 and verse 20, it says, According to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but all with all boldness, as always. So now also Christ will be manifested in my body, whether by life or by death. It says, I'm willing to give up everything for Christ. I'm willing to give up my very life I know I'm about to die, but it's going to be to the glory of our Father. This crown that he speaks about here in 2 Timothy. To those in the ancient world, it would have meant something of high status and high regard that you looked on someone that had a crown, and that meant that they were something, they were someone that meant something that was important. But this would have even been more important than anything else, even higher than all of those Olympians who had run in those races and had received a crown. All those kings who had gone before and had received a crown. But Paul knew this was much higher because this crown was a crown of righteousness. Like we had read before, he was willing to give up everything for that. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 14, it speaks about all the things that he had given up. He had given up his high status so that he could have a reward in heaven. He had given up everything that, he had, that, uh, that anyone would look upon him for. He had given up anything that was of high status to the Jews, anything to the Romans. He had given up it all. And he was now willing to give up his life for that crown in heaven. Brethren, we have this same promise of God. We have this same promise of Christ that Paul did. And that in that last day, we may attain the prize 
of life. The eternal spoils of victory. But we must know the giver. We must understand who he is and we must understand who the judge and the one who is dividing those spoils is. And we must make a decision that we will personally engage in this battle. And in doing so, we will reserve that reward that God has offered to us. So taking a look at this passage, we're going to go a little bit more in depth. Taking a look at this passage, we're going to split it up into three different sections uh, in order to have a better understanding. In verse 8 it says, In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward, award to me on that day. Brethren, if we want to know what the reward is, we first must understand who the judge is. We must know the giver of the prize. As was spoken about this morning, we know no victory except in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way that we know any reward is because of Christ's strength. Because of God's strength, we have the victory that we do. In fact, we can see this in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Paul understood that everything that we have, salvation, the grace we obtain, the life that we have, is all because of Christ and His love for us. That's the only way that we have anything in this life. The only way that we have victory is through our Lord Jesus. And because of that, we understand that He is then the giver of these blessings. And so because He is the giver of these blessings, what kind of a judge, what kind of a giver is He? Well, the Lord is very much so a righteous judge of our deeds. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 10. It says here, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. That is our goal. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. No matter what you have done, God sees you. No matter what we have done, God looks down on us and He sees what we are accomplishing. He sees the works that we are doing, whether they're good or whether they're bad. It's always been like that. And if God is going to be the divider of the spoils, there would be no other way that we could have those spoils righteously unless He knew exactly what we had done in this life. And so because God is all-knowing and He sees everything that we do, He's the only one that has the ability to give righteously. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10, it says that God is not unjust to forget your work. And he's not unjust to forget the love that you have shown in his name. He's not unjust because he knows what we have done. We cannot escape from God, whether for evil, and we cannot be forgotten by God because of the good that we have done. And so to know the victor is to know the spoils of that victory. In Philippians chapter 3, let's go ahead and turn over there. Philippians chapter 3 verses 9 through 11. It says here, after he gives this long list of all the things that he had put aside, it says, and may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteous which comes from God on the basis of faith, so that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. 
And he says all these things saying, I want to know God. I want to know the righteousness of God. I want to know the resurrection of the victory that God has had through His Son. And he says, after all that, I want to do this because in verse 14 he says, I strive, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God. He wants to know God because he knows that there's a goal. He knows that there is a prize that God will give to him if he knows who God is. Whenever we understand who God is, we understand that that's a blessing in and of itself. But God has given us even more. That because we know who He is, He will give us a reward in the end. And He will give it to us righteously. Not showing partiality toward anyone. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 6 through 9, It says here, For after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. And so we understand that as we had spoken of before, God is not mocked. So we need to live in a life that shows that we understand that God is not mocked. That we can't fool God. We can't trick Him into thinking that we're someone that we're not. Because He sees all. We may try to determine, well, this person's a Christian and this one's not. But it's really up to God. He's the one that knows. He's the one that knows our very deeds. And by knowing the giver of the prize, we must also understand that we must engage in battle. In verse 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 4, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. This might be almost in summation of what we've talked about this whole weekend. Understanding that we must be the ones to engage in battle. But we must be the ones engaging in battle because we know the hope that is before us. We know what is ahead of us. And so we cannot assume that others will fight for our freedom. We cannot assume that others are going to fight for our hope. But we must know that we are the ones that must fight. In Galatians chapter 6, it speaks to this. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 5. Galatians 6 and verse 5, it says, For each one will bear his own load. And then as we spoke about before, but here's the actual passage that it says in verse 7, Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. So let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So we must keep pushing. We must keep moving on because it is our responsibility. We must be the ones that are personally engaged in this fight, in this battle against Satan. And we must do it here while we still have life here on earth. We must fight in this battle. And this will take a deep desire to please the righteous judge. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 5, it says, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. 
Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. So we must look at ourselves and we must look at the scriptures to see what will please God. What will please Him in this fight that we are conducting ourselves in. And it's not just going to take deep desire, but it's going to take discipline. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24-27 through 27 talks about this race that people would be running. And they run it not as ones who are just uh, half-heartedly doing it, and they're not boxing as ones that are just half-heartedly doing it, but they have it with full determination. That they are disciplined and know what they're doing. They've worked hard. They've worked out. They've built themselves up so that they could be good soldiers of the cross. And as Paul claimed that Timothy was as his son in the faith. And brethren, this fight is a good fight. Because it's being fought by keeping our faith. When we look into the fight and we look into our personal engagement, we must understand that it is only accomplished by us keeping our own faith. By us looking deep down and seeing, am I in Christ? So this fight is good. And by fighting, God will take the spoils. He will take the spoils and divide it up amongst us. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we, we've already read verses 7 and 8, but let's look at it again. It says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. It's those who fight. It's those who love God. And it's those who have kept the faith. And God will divide the spoils amongst us. He will separate them out so that we can have eternal life. Over in Jude, verse 20. Jude, verse 20 and 21, and then skipping down. It says in verse 20, But you, beloved, build yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, awaiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some, hate, or have mercy with fear, hating even the garments polluted by the flesh. Verse 24, Now to you who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of His glory blameless with great joy to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. He says that is the God. He is the only one that can give you what you're looking for. He's the only one that can reward you from your fighting. He's the only one that can sustain you in your faith so that you will fight. So he says, build yourselves up in that faith which God has given you. And whenever we do that, we will be the strong. Isaiah 53 and verse 12 says that he will divide the booty among the strong. And so we must build ourselves up so that God will divide the spoils amongst us. We must engage in the battle, ready to fight, so that we will one day be rewarded. So we must know the giver of the prize. We must engage in the battle. And in doing so, we must also reserve the reward. Turn back over and look in verse 8. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also who have loved His appearing. We must reserve the reward that God has offered to us. Turn over to 1 Peter. The phrase that I got this, reserve the reward, comes from, from this passage. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-5, through 5, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Our reward is secure. We may think that our, our bank accounts here on earth are secure. But God has a bank that it will reserve our reward until eternity. We'll never lose that reward if we keep fighting in the battle. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. The same idea is brought about whenever it says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world, not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is life indeed. Brethren, the riches that we can have here on earth are not even close to being in comparison with the riches that we will find in heaven. The Lord is the one who has won. He is the one that has had the victory. It's not us. It's not us by building up the riches and fighting with actual armies here on earth, but the Lord has already won the battle. As some have said, some people say that, that God is fighting with us, but the fact of the matter is that God has already fought for us. And He has offered us the spoils. And so He is the one that deserves all glory. It's not us. But He has so graciously offered the treasures of heaven to the waste of the earth. And if we have been offered the best of heaven, then how could we even consider the treasures of the world? In Matthew, you know the passage, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, nor thieves will break in and steal. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and wealth. And so we cannot lay up here on this earth grand amounts of money because we need to store up for ourselves the treasure in heaven where God will keep it. In 1 John chapter 2 and verses 15 and 17, we were storing up for ourselves things of the world. Because it says, do not love the world or the things in the world. For the, all the things that are in the world, the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those things, he says, those are going to fade away. Those are going to be destroyed. Those are going to be burned up, as he says, uh, as Peter says in his letters. Those things are not going to remain, so don't love them. But love God and love His treasures that He is offering to you. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 26, it speaks about Moses and how he wasn't worried about what he would have here on earth. He wasn't uh, concerned about having the, the best things of Egypt because he thought that it would be better for him to go toward Christ. In verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. We need to be ones that have gold in our eyes, that we're looking toward the reward that we will someday have in eternity. Like Moses who looked beyond. He looked beyond the riches of this world and he looked only to Christ. He looked only to the spoils that he would give to us in the last day. So brethren, if we wish to reserve our reward, then we need to love God with everything that we have. And we need to love His Son. And we need to be ready for His second coming. 
when the final enemy will be destroyed. And the victor, he will give us the riches of his conquering power. This morning you all talked about that that conquering power was from the resurrection, from, from Christ taking victory over death. But yet we still die. Because death will not be ultimately conquered until that last day. Whenever the trumpets will sound and all the dead will be raised. And there will be no more death. And so if there's no more death, what would be a greater prize? What is the only prize that God could give us? But eternal life. That's the only outcome that we can have if there is no more death. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 through 9. It says here, In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Peter says, I know who you love. And I know who you're looking toward. And I know the reward that you're waiting on. It's imperishable. It will not be destroyed. We already read Jude where it speaks about this reward, but, but let's look over in Romans chapter 8. This will be the final passage that we'll take a look at. Romans chapter 8, in verse 18. It says here, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. It's not even comparable. We may suffer here on earth. We may not have enough money to even buy bread, which is very unlikely in this country. But we may not even have enough money that, that we can do much at all. We can't do the finer things that, that most people would think are necessities. And, and we can't do even sometimes the necessities. But, but Paul says that it doesn't matter. Because it's going to be so much better. You can't even compare how bad this is to how great it will be in the end. How great that reward will be. And in verse 23 through 25, And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. Are you waiting? Are you opening up your eyes? Ready for that reward. Ready to see God. The one who gives you the reward. The one who has enlisted you in this battle. The one who is reserving your reward until you return home. If we know the Lord, then we know that He already has one. And He has done it for our good. He's done it so that each and every one of us can find the end goal of heaven. But He begs you, and He begs me. He begs us to pick up our swords and fight. He wants us to put up in battle, to go forward, marching on with determination and deep desire, knowing that the end is what we've been longing for, because it is with the one that we have been loving our whole lives. What greater reward is that? He will reserve it for us. So brethren, fight the good fight. 
Keep the faith. Because there's a crown of righteousness for you waiting in heaven. It's being reserved for you. Ready for you to take it up. Put it on your head. And being able to live with God for eternity. What greater thing to conclude this weekend on than knowing that we will be rewarded for our fight. There was a story that I had heard. It was about this woman that she was a famous runner, a professional runner, and, and she was invited to attend this race. And so she accepted, and uh, the morning of the race, she got up and she got ready, and then she drove all the way from New York City to Connecticut. And she thought she was following the directions that she had been given. However, she was given these directions over the phone, so it, it was kind of blurry, and so she got lost. And so once she got lost, uh, she had asked the gas station person that she had uh, come to. Apparently she didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> but uh, she, she came up to the person who was at the gas station, and the only thing she remembered is that it was starting at a shopping center parking lot. And so she asked if this gas station uh, uh, attendant knew about that. And he knew about the, the race, and so he sent her to uh, the right direction toward the race. And so once she got there, for some reason it just seemed a little bit small for the group that she had been expecting. Uh, it it kind of gotten some talk, and so she assumed that there would be more people. Uh, however, uh, she just assumed after that, well, this will just be an easy race to win. And so whenever she uh, comes up to the registration booth, she comes up to the people and tells them her name. And then uh, the people, she's so surprised that they're so excited to see her. They, uh, they were so surprised that this racer, this, this female who had won so many races, was so famous, was going to be running in their race. And so she runs the race. Uh, they, they say, well, we know you haven't registered yet, but we'll go ahead and put this number down, and if you get up there, you can get to the starting line uh, before the gun goes off. So she gets there, and she starts running, and sure enough, she wins the race. In fact, she wins it with four minutes to spare, with the next guy behind her uh, being in second place four minutes behind. And it wasn't until after the race... Whenever she wasn't given an envelope with the uh, bulks of money and the performance prize, but she realized that she had gotten to the wrong one. There was the actual race she was wanting to go to was several miles still down the road. And so she had missed out. She had gone to the wrong starting line, run the wrong course, and she had missed out on a very valuable prize. Have we done that? Have we come up to the wrong starting line? Have we run the wrong course? Because if we have, we're not going to receive what we think we're going to. So we need to make sure that we're on the right path. We need to make sure that we are fighting for the right side. We don't want to end up in the end that we realize that we were fighting for Satan. We don't want to realize at the end that we were racing in Satan's laps. But we need to make sure that we are pushing forward toward Christ. Because He is our end goal. He is the one we're looking toward and He is the one that we're going to live our whole lives for, fighting for every day of our lives. If you're on the wrong path, you need to turn back. And if you haven't even stepped up to the starting line, then do so now before the gun goes off. Before it's too late that you can't run anymore and there will be no reward for you in the end. There's water. What hinders you from being baptized? Whatever your need is, we ask you, we implore you, pick up your sword and fight. Be ready for the battle, because it most certainly will come. Whatever your need is this evening, we ask you to please come forward as we stand and sing the songs of Miss Selected. Please come.